you've tuned in to Startups for the Rest of Us. We are approaching episode 600 here in another 12 episodes or so. And today's episode is really good. I really enjoyed this conversation with Cortland Allen. He and I basically wander through topics that are relevant to bootstrappers and indie hackers and non-bootstrappers and mostly bootstrappers. We talk about things ranging from inside baseball on podcast production to talking about, you know, struggles with motivation and and depression to whether it's easier to bootstrap today, what it looked like 10 years ago. At the end we talk about base camp. I don't know, we we just covered a lot of things. I did a little ask on Twitter of what topics we should cover. And of course, we got 30 topics or something. So we couldn't possibly cover all of them. But I am bookmarking that tweet for future episodes, because I think some of the topics and questions were really interesting. Before we dive into our conversation, I want to let you know that there's just a few more days in the Tiny Seed application process. If you are a bootstrapped or mostly bootstrapped SaaS founder, you're doing at least $500 a month, and you're interested in a year-long mentorship advice community program, as well as a little bit of funding, just enough funding, the right amount of funding for a bootstrapper. You should head to tinyc.com slash apply and find out more. The application process is pretty seamless. It's 15, 20 minutes. Most people, if you know your numbers, it's not that arduous. And you'd be following in the footsteps of some pretty great SaaS companies that have been coming through our ranks. So we are running batches both in the Americas time zones, North and South America, as well as the European time zones. So Europe, Middle East, and Africa. tinyc.com slash apply if you're interested. And with that, let's dive into our conversation. I'm Rob Walling. You're Cortland Allen. We're, put, we're putting this on both of our feeds. We are. So it's, I, I can't just like do the start of the rest of us intro because people <laughs> be like, wait a minute, this is on the Indie Hackers feed. So I think we're coming out a day apart, but uh, I'm excited to sit down with you, man. Me too. You're always one of my favorite people to uh, chat with and like podcast for them. And in real life too, you asked the question on Twitter, what should we talk about? And we got like a million different answers. Plus we had a list of stuff we want to talk about. And so maybe we'll go long this time. This, I think we can. Yeah, th- I'm excited about it. Likewise too, I appreciate the compliment. I certainly feel the same way. I really look forward to you and I sitting down because we have, I feel like we have sh- enough shared views and enough shared kind of worldviews of bootstrapping and indie hacking that it makes sense, but not the overlap's not a complete circle, you know, like a Venn diagram that's just a circle. And so there's, I always learn, I feel like I learn from you and I expand my thinking when, when we talk. It's funny you say that. I, I listened to your episode on uh, My First Million, and I think near the end of the episode, you were giving startup ideas. And Sam Parr, I think, was the one hosting that particular one. And he's a funny guy because he's so disagreeable. <laughs> like, no matter what you say, he'll just like come out and be like, I think this is absolutely untrue <laughs> to say the exact opposite. Yeah. And he's not afraid of looking dumb and being wrong or whatever. And that like is really entertaining, but I think you and I agree on a lot. <laughs> so we we probably won't have uh, that kind of that kind of talk. But agreement is also cool. Oh yes, we will because I'm going dis- <laughs> to make me disagree with everything you say just to do it. <laughs> well, the first thing I'm going to say is I just made an offer to a producer who's going to really be heading up all the kind of back office stuff for startups to the rest of us, the MicroConf podcast, MicroConf YouTube. Total inside baseball from one podcaster to another. But do you still do a lot of the work? I know I don't imagine you do audio editing, but like are you scheduling guests and putting stuff into WordPress, writing show notes, or have you been able to like get that stuff off your plate? Off my plate. Okay. Best best hire I've ever made was uh, I call her my podcast boss, Ari mm-hmm. Zormo. She was a producer for Mixergy. Uh, she mm-hmm. still is a producer for Mixergy, but she does the Andy Hackers podcast now. And I just like have her do literally everything <laughs> that she possibly can that I don't feel like I need to be involved in. And so I like kind of being involved in the guest selection. Who's going to come on? Who do I want to talk to? Because if like someone else is choosing who I talk to, then like, I don't know, maybe I could outsource that. But right now, like I, I, I like choosing who I want to talk to. And I like sort of helping prepare. But what's cool about Ari is I have her come on and even these things that I want to do, like we'll be on a Zoom call where she's sitting there watching me work <laughs> and offering suggestions. And so I'm not even like doing that alone. She's kind of my podcast boss. She holds my feet to the fire. She makes sure I work on it a few hours a week and she gives me like helpful feedback while I'm working on it. And then I sit down, press record, talk to my guest, press stop at the end of the conversation. We chat a little bit and then I, I do nothing else. I don't title the episode. I don't describe the episode. I don't tweet about it. I don't release it. I'm on to the next thing. And it's such a breath of fresh air because I think a lot of podcasts, people churn. <laughs> Most podcasts don't last for much longer than a few episodes. And I think it's because people get bogged down by all this extra work that they don't really enjoy as much as they enjoy the conversations themselves. Right. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm 
happy for you and I'm happy for me that next week that <laughs> I'll be in a similar situation. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I'm probably 75 or 80% of the way to where you are, okay. but I've just piecemealed it together with like a part-time freelancer who does the show notes and mm. a part-time, you know, an editor who does this and that. And then there's some gaps there. There's right. some gaps and I am the fallback, yeah. you know, and with microconf stuff, Xander, producer Xander is a fallback. And so we're bringing someone in to really backstop that. Finally, I mean, it should have been done last year or years ago, right. to be honest, yeah. but it's just one of those things that you you do the same thing for too long and you don't think about how it should change. Right. You get used to it. You kind yeah. of assume. And it's stressful being like, like you said, there's these gaps. It's stressful having to be the glue yep. that sort of glues all these things together to fill the gaps because then it's like, it's almost in a way as if like everything is a gap. Like you still have to worry about every single thing, every single part of the process. And it's also stressful to like hire somebody and just trust them to do everything. Yep. Because like they're not going to be as good at you as you at some things. They're not going to have your particular eye for certain things. But the cool thing is like they'll be good at stuff that you aren't good at if you make a good hire. And they'll improve your show in ways that you didn't really anticipate. And so I think a lot of it is just learning to let go <laughs> and have someone else do those things for you and see what comes out and, you know, go with it. Yeah, and I've always been able to let go, like when building SaaS companies, it's like, I can let go of customer support. I was able to let go of software development. I can let go of customer success and sales, on and on and on. Letting go of like creative stuff for me, like writing and and podcasting, and that stuff's a lot harder for me because it's like there's so much subtlety to it. It's less of a, less of a here's a job description. It's more like you kind of just got to do it, you know, and make it good, and that's hard, right? There's, a, uh, there's a, a popular indie hacker, I won't say who it is. He has more than 40,000 followers on Twitter, and his Twitter account is entirely automated. He never tweets. <laughs> he doesn't even know what he's tweeting. There's a team of people who tweet for him, and his Twitter account's fire. It's awesome. He tweets several times a day. People engage. Some of the tweets are really personal, but he is like the ultimate in like <laughs> being comfortable, I guess, letting Seriously? go of the creative <laughs> element. I can't wow. imagine doing that. Me neither. That's awesome, though. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, so Indie Hackers went invite only. Is that right? About five, six months ago? Yeah. I don't know if you've talked about that publicly, but I'm just wondering like what the, was around that decision. And is that like, just does that just come with growth of a community? It was like, I mean, it was very simple. Spam was out of control. And I have been fighting against spammers from like day two of the forum for like five years. And they're so good. They're not just like people making little bots. Like they're actual human beings sitting in offices somewhere on the other side of the world, like getting paid to spam websites and not caring at all. And if you put up obstacles, they will figure out what the obstacle is and try to get around it. And at some point last summer, like I think we had like six or 7,000 people join Indie Hackers and like 2,000 of them were spammers. <laughs> and I was like, this is a battle that I'm losing. And I just want to go back to basics. I'm not obsessed with growth at all costs. Like we don't need to have, you know, thousands of people joining every week. We can just go invite only mode, completely cut out the spammers and have the community sort of return to some level of normalcy. And I like the idea of an invite tree where you can see every single person, who they were invited by, who that person was invited by, who that person was invited by. Because then you start to build sort of like uh, a sort of a clearer picture of, okay, this guy's a spammer. Like, how do they get invited? Oh, all these other accounts are spammers too. And so we left it on invite only mode for, you know, the better half of last year. And I'm pretty sure we've rooted out like literally 100% of the spammers. Six months ago when people complained about spam on indie hackers, they, they were complaining about like people posting escort ads and Viagra pills ads. Today when people complain about spam and indie hackers, they're saying, oh, this person made a post that I didn't like, <laughs> which is a huge improvement. Right. Their marketing, their startup. That's a trip. So I never, I mean, I'm on indie hackers relatively frequently and I never saw the spam. Was, was it just getting rooted out before I saw it or what was the deal? Yeah. I mean, so what, what time zone are you in? You're in the United uh, States. Central so you're like time. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you were like in like Europe, you saw a lot of spam. Oh, so what okay. happened is we would go to sleep. Community manager would go to sleep. The forum would be overrun with spam. Or if like, depending on your browsing habits, like if you go to indiehackers.com slash newest and you just see like the fire hose of posts, a lot of that was just spam. And most people don't go there, but like the people who do go there, the people who want to curate the community and have, you know, some sort of control over what makes it to the front page by uploading stuff. And like they were just deluged of spam. And that sucks because if they can't go there and get a good experience, they're not going to go there, which means no one's sort of giving us the signals we need and uploading posts to figure out what should go to the homepage. That's a problem, a big problem. Yeah. You know, one of the things I was most frustrated with running Drip 
was the spammer slash people who would hack, not hack in, but they'd sign up for an account and they'd do phishing attacks out of Drip. Or they would or they would send shady emails and get us on blacklist. Like it was such a headache. And we had all these checks in. We had this code that would validate. It was like credit card versus some actions in the app. I mean, it, you could call it, the, these days if we we're raising funding, we would call it an AI thing. But it was just, it was just code that measured we, we could detect patterns and behaviors. I hated it. And it was one of the, things that it was a smaller factor, but I remember being like, I could see selling this company purely, be, you know, on the worst days of those, like when, when Derek and I went to sleep and then at Sunday, you know, it was this Monday morning at 2 a.m. and then like Russian basically spammers like created a bunch of accounts, sent a bunch of phishing stuff. And I thought I could sell this company. And that was early <laughs> on, you know, we're at like 20K MRR. So did it do that for you? Did it, did it ever feel like, you know what, I could rage quit this thing up in here because of this? Yeah, I never got quite to the point of like I would quit because of this, but it's super demoralizing because it's like the number one thing I think about every day is like how do I improve the community? How do I like promote the people who are doing like, you know, a genuine, authentic job of contributing great content and stories? And then you have these other people who just cause you to lose your faith in humanity. They're just like total ass like sociopathic. They just don't care. You're trying to build a good thing. They are just trying to ruin it. They're not even trying to ruin it. They're just trying to promote their own thing. They don't care that it's going to ruin your thing. And I've talked to so many people who dealt with this problem. You know, it was like famously at PayPal, you know, they're like sending money over the internet and a huge percentage of what they needed to do to make that business work was get really smart at fighting fraudsters. And that was super hard for them to do. And they had a super talented team to do it. I talked to Amjad Massad at Repilit. So it's like an online sort of code editing tool and code education tool. And it's like, what do people use Repilit for? building sorts of like crypto bots to mine crypto using his server's bandwidth and costing the company a whole bunch of money. And they just don't care if they're going to ruin Repolit's business if they can make a few thousand dollars. Time and time again, I talk to people who have this issue where you just like deal with the worst people. <laughs> so the internet's cool because you can reach everybody. You can reach all the good people, but you also end up on the radar and straight in the crosshairs of sort of the bad people who don't care. Yeah, when you get any modicum of success, I mean, we have tiny seed companies who by the time they hit 20K MRR, 25K, so it's still relatively small. If they send any type of email, if there's any type of email sending capability, like people start targeting them in terms of, oh, I'm going to do a phishing attack, I'm going to do a you know spam attack, I'm going to send unsolicited email based on your good good uh, IPs. This doesn't happen in real life as much. You know, like if you have like, a, like an events business or like a store, like you don't get people who come into your store and just start like yelling loudly to advertise their product. <laughs> you know, like you just don't deal with like that many. I guess, you know, you have like shoplifters and stuff. There's like not as many apps when you can see people face to face, you know, you can look the owner in the eyes and see that it's a human. You're like, I don't want to ruin this person's business, you know, but online people just kind of, you know, they kind of default to like, everything's a faceless corporation. If I can take advantage of them, I'll do it. That's right. The anonymity is a real problem, right? right? Is that they can remain anonymous. I mean, we've seen that with online forums, right? It's like in Facebook, I know people get out of control too, but at least usually your real name's attached to it versus YouTube comments, even, you know, Reddit to a certain degree. I think there's a big, big case to be made there. Yep. Yep. But Indie Hackers is no longer invite only I as of that. three weeks ago. Huh. So it is, uh, anybody can join. And now we have a whole process. A lot of it's manual where we'll like sort of look at like your contributions. So when you join, you can't make a post, but you can make comments. You can sort of help other people out in the community and contribute and discuss and upvote comments. And essentially, if you earn your way out of that sort of uh, second class citizenship, shall we call it, you'll get a little email from me and we'll promote you and you can now be like a fully fledged member of the community. And every now and then we'll just promote somebody. Like, you know, if we do an AMA with somebody, we'll just kick them right up to a full fledged member because that's somebody that we know and trust. But everybody else has to go through this process. And it's really good at weeding out like who wants to be an authentic member of the community and who wants to just do like a drive by, hey, I'm launching my product today. <laughs> can you give me access so I can launch today and then, you know, disappear and go somewhere else? And it's, it's really funny to me like how people will literally ask to do that. Like I get emails every, every day, like, Hey, you know, I'm launching today. I haven't put any work or effort into the community. Can you just whitelist me so I can do my drive by post? Even when we got rid of the, the spam with the invite codes, I got DMS on Twitter from spammers. They're like, Hey, I'm trying to post my Viagra pills thing and I can't get in. Like, can I get an invite code? I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, why would you ask me this? Yeah, it's crazy. It's like, they think you're a customer service rep who just doesn't know any better, you know, yeah. and who's going to send that. That's such a trip, man. We had similarly, it's odd that a uh, forum spam or for, yeah, forum spammers, community spammers, and email spammers are similar because we built up a thing. We architected it out and we never got to build it, but it was a trust score. And it was like when you first signed up for Drip, your trust score was like zero. And then depending on what you did and your open rates and your click rates and what your credit card was prepaid or not, there were all these factors. There were like 10 factors. Over time, that score would go up 
or it would go down. And so if you had, you know, you got a bunch of spam complaints or you got uh, low open rates, like we would start to knock that down. And when you got below a certain threshold, we'd block sending on your account. And when you obviously, you know, you built it up over time, I think if you had a bunch of sends that went great, you get up to 10, 20, 30 or whatever. And so it sounds like you figured out a nice, perhaps an easier way to kind of hack that. Same thing with any hackers. You basically get a little score. You don't see your score, but like, okay, below a certain score, I don't even look at your comments and stuff. Above a certain score, like admins can kind of like, we have some moderators and stuff. We can kind of see, okay, here are the people this week who've reached this score. Here are their comments. Like, who should we promote into a fully fledged member? It's funny because like, you know, there's a whole Black Mirror episode <laughs> on this. It's like very dystopian <laughs> when this woman has like everyone I've in society it. has a little score and people can constantly score you and she just has like the worst day ever and gets like a negative score. And now she's like, an outcast and she can't get an apartment and can't get invited to parties. But I think in reality, it's not, it's not so bleak. It's usually pretty useful and it makes the community better for everybody for there to be the score that's invisible because so long as it's responsible and it can't be like gamed to like ruin a perfectly good person's time. It works. Yep. I agree. So I sent a tweet out. I found some pictures from MicroConf 2011. It was the very first MicroConf. And so this is like 11 years ago. And I posted a picture of like, it's like Andrew Warner taking the stage for the first ever talk at the first ever MicroConf. And he looks, we all look super young. I mean, because it's 11 years ago. Yeah. And so Andrew Warner, and then there's like me and Mike Tabor and Ramit and Heaton Shah and the Texan guys are Sean Ellis and heat and shot. So there's there's this handful of picks. It got me thinking though, as I look back, I was like, man, we were really young and we didn't know what kind of what we were doing. And here I am still doing, I was Same doing thing. the podcast then. Yeah, I was still, I was talking about startups. I was running events and I'm still doing those things. And it got me thinking, I don't often try to look out five, 10, 15 years because it's just so far in the future. But I'm wondering if you, if you have you know, do you ever think like, what am I going to be doing in a decade? Am I still going to be doing something similar related to this? Or do I think I'm going to, you know, this, I'll have a time doing this and maybe switch it up. I live in the future, man. Me I'm too. Like, I, I think way too much <laughs> about the future. There's a good book. It's called The Time Paradox, where they talk about how a lot of our decision making and life comes down to sort of the default time frame that we live in. And some people sort of default to the past. Some people default to the present in certain situations. And like, I think probably most tech founders and entrepreneurs are like very future focused people, which I think correlates highly with like success because we're often thinking, you know, what can I do now to get to this desired state five or 10 years from now? And like that turns out to be a really good way to plan and strategize, but it's also not the best way to sort of enjoy life in the present. And so, you know, I remember being in, in school and going to MIT and thinking at the end of our sort of uh, four years in our fraternity, Everybody could get up and you could just talk and you can give a speech and you could say whatever you want. It was an awesome tradition because it's like you just got 40 years to think about what you're going to say and you get up and you talk. And one of the cool things about it was everybody felt so lucky to go to that school. People would like sort of default assume that you were smart and give you the benefit of the doubt. But I thought a lot about it and it's like none of us are here because of who we are now. Like we're here of like because of decisions we made when we were like 12 years old. <laughs> we were like 13 years old. Like I'm going to take school seriously and I'm going to study for the SAT. And like now 10 years later, that's paying off. And that's something that never really, it's a lesson that never really left me. You know, like uh, the decisions you make now will change your life dramatically five, 10 years from in the future. And so I hope that 10 years from now, I'm still working on Indie Hackers. If I'm working on Indie Hackers 10 years from now, that means Indie Hackers is in an amazing place that I'm probably super jazzed about, or it's way bigger and more impactful than it is now. And if I'm not working on Indie Hackers 10 years from now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a failure, but it definitely means I moved on to something else that was more exciting. And it's not really my plan right now. Like my plan right now is to try to build any hackers into like an institution, you know, something that like really touches a ton of lives in a really positive way. And I think it already does, but like, I think if you build a good thing, like bringing it to more people is an even better thing. You know, if you build like a really cool tool or really cool, like, I don't know, like, you know, sandwich, <laughs> sandwich shop, and you can like franchise it. And now more people in the world can eat that sandwich. Like, that's a good thing. If you invent penicillin, you know, it's a hundred times better if you bring it to a hundred times more people. I've been trying to make Indie Hackers a good thing, and I want it to bring it to thousands of times more people. And that might take five or 10 years. It's interesting you say that because obviously you and I have both been doing this now for years, talking to and trying to help aspiring and and actual founders. I guess we're all actual founders, but founders who have actually shipped and, you know, who are just working on it and want to do it. And it wasn't until the last couple years really as like, I have this podcast, I have microconf, and now we're going to launch Tiny Seed out of it. And I started thinking like, what is the, I think I'm, I think we're grown up enough that I need a mission. You know what I mean? Like, what is the mission? And I've been honing it and refining it. And I still, 
I still struggle with exact wording, but like the mission, I threw it out, to, uh, you know, I tossed it to producer Xander, I showed a and and Tracy. And what's interesting is the mission of all three of those properties is the same thing. The mission of Tiny Seed, MicroConf, and Startups for Fest. It's all the same. It's to dramatically multiply the number of self-sustaining independent startups in the world. And whether the wording exactly, is it SaaS startups, is it this, but that's, I just want there to be more and I want them to be self-sustaining. So look, maybe they took funding, maybe they didn't. I don't give a shit. <laughs> and in fact, I never have. It's, you know, I just don't want the dogma. But so what's interesting is once I said that mission, I was like, wait a minute, I've been doing that for like 16 years, I th- uh, more than that, 17. So 2005 is when I started blogging about this. And it's like, I didn't have that mission in mind, but that is what I want to do now for me for the rest of my life. Like, that's it. I, for the rest of my professional career, I'm sure, I think I'll be working till I'm basically keel over dead. But That was an interesting umbrella term for me to realize, you know what, I enjoy podcasting and I'm going to keep doing it, but I don't need to podcast if I'm still doing something that follows that mission, right? And I don't need to have an online community, you know, and I don't need to have a fund, but I think I will be doing something under that umbrella forever. I think that's a great, a great sort of vision. You know, like one of my heroes is Charlie Munger. He has like a lot of writing and business advice that influenced me, just life advice and ways to think that influenced me when I was younger. Dude is 98 years old. You know, we did last year like a podcast where he's distilling investment advice and talking about how he's running Berkshire Hathaway with Warren Buffett. You know, he's 98. He's found what he loves. He's, it's, I don't know, kept him healthy and mentally, he's super sharp, just as engaged as ever. Uh, I think that's a great goal. And I think, you know, your mission for MicroConf is kind of like, not just MicroConf, but like everything you do, Tiny Seed as well, it's kind of the same as mine. You know, I want more people to become financially independent and free to live the lives that they want to live. You know, and I think that starting online businesses is one of the best ways to do it. It's increasingly becoming accessible and, and a good way for people to do it. And it's f-ing encouraging to see everyone doing it. And so, like, that's my mission, too. And, you know, I was reading some research. My buddy Julian turned me on to this researcher. Her name is Erin Westgate. And she published this paper about different types of lives that people can live that are good. And so there's kind of this idea of, like, the happy life. And happy life is characterized by, it's kind of the most obvious life that people want, like a life full of comfort and joy, security, free time, you know, money, satisfaction. But then there's also like this other type of life that people can optimize for, which is like a meaningful life. And that's a life full of like significance and purpose and coherence and societal contribution. And I think the older one gets, the more we think about living a meaningful life. Like what's the purpose of it all? You know, because more and more of our life is behind us and less and less is ahead of us. And so we think, okay, what's the lasting impact that I'm having? And that starts to become much more valuable to us than it was when we were like 25, just thinking about how to be happy in the the short term. And so I I think it's the same with the business, you know, in a career, like it makes a lot of sense as we get older to think about, okay, what's the impact of what I'm doing? How do I sort of tie all the things I'm doing together into like some sort of mission and impact? And there's a lot of personal satisfaction that comes from having a meaningful life. Yeah, I always say entrepreneurs most should seek freedom, purpose, and relationships. Kind of in that order, although relationships probably uh, before purpose, I think, or in tandem with it. But like, I think that's one of the reasons I sought entrepreneurship was the freedom from a day job and the freedom from being told what to build and when. And I remember working, working, working towards it because I live in the future like you do and just thinking to that day when I quit the job. And then I got it and I was like, this is amazing. And it was amazing for like three months. And then I was like, I'm kind of bored, you know, like what do I need to do next? <laughs> because I had freedom, but I really didn't have a purpose. I had a bunch of small apps that were kind of like, uh, all had this autopilot traffic from SEO and ads and this and that, but it, like nothing was that interesting to me. It was just a paycheck. And, you know, it was a nice paycheck. It was a hundred and, I don't know, 120 to 150 grand back. This is in 2007. So it like went a long way. Yeah, it was great. And I was like, yeah, I'm free. But then I was like, uh-oh, I need, I need to find a purpose. And that was where I really double started doubling down on, talking about this on writing and doing the book and the podcast and all of that came out in about an 18 month period because I was like, I want there to be more. And here's the other thing, relationships. There was kind of no one else doing it. Joel Spolsky was blogging in the early 2000s and he, but he started a software company and then Patrick McKenzie started blogging a couple years after I did. And he and I ran across each other and I, and then I'd heard of Basecamp, right? And they had this SaaS that I didn't use, but I'm getting to 2008, 2009. And I'm like, is anyone else thinking about it or doing this whole, you know, the kind of indie hacker, like bootstrap startup path? Is that a, is it a thing or am I the only one that's done it or will ever do it? You know, cause I genuinely didn't know. And that was part of building the audience that then turned into the community was like, I want to be able to hang out with other people who talk about this stuff. Cause this is really interesting to me and no, no one else in my town gives a shit about this, but I need, I, can I find a hundred people that I can get into a room with, you know, that, that care about it? And that was a, that was a big thing. I mean, it's like that purpose thing that you're talking about, like freedom. Like 
when I talk to indie hackers, the vast majority of indie hackers are looking for some type of freedom. That's why they're starting their business, because they feel like they don't want to work for somebody else. They want more time. They want to work with people they like. They want creative freedom. They want financial independence and no ceiling on their income. And I think that that is like a purpose, right? Like that can be your purpose to like have this epic adventure that you're going on in order to earn your freedom. And like you and I have both been on that adventure for some part of our life. But then you get your freedom (laughs) and you get there and like suddenly you lose your purpose. You know, it's like you had this epic journey and you completed it and you succeeded. And that's like, now what? Right. Like it's like Frodo at the end of the Lord of the Rings. Like the movie ends there. It's like he casts the ring to the fire. Like, I don't know, there's like 10 different ending scenes, but then it's over (laughs) and the credits, the credits roll. And it's like, well, what did Frodo do after that? You know, like sit around in the Shire, like telling stories about how he had this epic adventure at some point, like it's kind of hard to figure out what do you do after you sort of accomplished your mission? Like, how do you find a new purpose? Right. And we can't just get on the boat to the undying lands. Like, he right. Did. Yeah. Oh, he just right? sailed so, west. So <laughs> not, a, not a thing. <laughs> I want to like piggyback on that topic. Cause you just talked about losing your purpose or like you find it. It's the arrival fallacy, right? Is what it is. You arrive. And then you're like, once I will, I will arrive once I do this. And you do for about a month or three months. And then you decide, Oh, I need to do something new. But I, I tweeted out, and you retweeted, thanks. Uh, you know, what should you and I talk about on this episode? And there's a, there's too many topics for us to cover. But one that I think is interesting is Arvid Call said, please give the mental health topic some time. Building anything is hard. Building it in the middle of a pandemic is even harder. Some people need permission to let themselves feel this. And you both can help there. And this obviously is a topic that like my wife talks. My wife's a clinical psychologist. You should check out the Zen Founder podcast if you want every week. She's re- releasing an episode on this topic as a founder, married to a founder, consults with founders, and as a psychologist. But... Aside from that, like you and I have shared our own struggles with building businesses and mental health during during that. So why don't you start and then I'll go because I I, have, I think we both have war stories, you know. Mental health is super important. You know, I've struggled with like various mental health issues sometimes. I've been very depressed. I think three times in my life, and like one of them was this past year. I had a good six months where I was just like, what's the point of anything? <laughs> why do anything? You know, and it was a hard time because it's like the pandemic was very isolating. I had this road trip that I've talked about where I was just like not really seeing anyone. And I moved to Seattle and it was like kind of isolating as well. And I think for me, it really tied into this this topic of purpose. Because from like probably age eight to age 34, I've always had this sort of vision of like, what do I, what do, I do with my life? And it's like, I'm on this epic adventure, right? I'm trying to build some very big, ambitious project. And it's usually creative. It usually involves like building a website and designing it and putting code together, which is like this awesome feedback loop of reward and work and then reward and then work. And I think for the first time since I was eight, I kind of got off it last year and was like, well, what else is there to life? And I sort of found myself spinning and I wasn't sure what the reason was. You know, it was like, there's all these like other proximate reasons. Like, you know, is my relationship with my girlfriend going okay? Or is it like my living situation? And it's really easy to like sort of blame the wrong thing. But I think at, at the core, I just sort of lost the drive that I had that filled up my days and like made every day feel like I was excited to wake up and do something, you know? And I think everybody has their own like sort of loop, their own sort of like, their own sort of like natural process where left to their own devices, they'll do something. For a lot of people, it's like, I'm going to look at social media. (laughs) I'm going to come home and look at TikTok on my phone. For a lot of people, it's like, I'm going to come home and spend time with my family. For a lot of people, uh, I dated someone once, you know, she would just like impulsively just go out and just meet strangers. And she loved to do that. And that was like kind of her happy, like sort of resting place. And for me, it's always like, I'm going to sit down on my computer and I'm going to code something really cool and try to work on it. And like, I think without that, and without replacing that with anything, it was very easy for me to sit around and be like, well, now what, you know? And like, now I'm like dependent on other people to come in and like, you know, hang out with me to do something entertaining or stimulating. Or it was very easy to just like, start questioning my purpose in life. And so, I don't know, I think this happens to a lot of founders. You know, I've talked to a lot of people who, I mean, it's a kind of a, a cliche. People like reach some like level of financial success or they achieve some goal and then they're just like aimless. <laughs> And embarrassingly enough for me, like it took me like six months to figure out why. And then like another few months to figure out, okay, what what can I do that has like meaning and purpose that'll, that'll be interesting and like, like, you know, fulfill me. And then the answer is like, oh, I should just work on indie hackers. (laughs) Oh yeah. Like I'm working on indie hackers for more than just like these sort of like earlier reasons. I'm, I'm working on it because it actually is fun for me. It actually is entertaining. It actually is meaningful. Like I love the people that I work with, the people that I talk to, the problems that we're trying to solve. Like all the challenges in front of me with indie hackers and the way that I want to grow the site are really interesting for their own sake. And so I had to kind of have this period of rediscovering why I'm working, not even rediscovering, but sort of changing the reasons why I'm working on the site and diving into those. And I'm hoping that like my entire life, probably hope for everybody, this is the case that my entire life was full of like these epic adventures and there's never really an end point. 
you know, there's never really like a midlife crisis point where I'm, I'm done and I've accomplished the goal and that's it. You know, I hope that I'm always sort of struggling towards something that is really meaningful and really enjoyable in the meantime. And that even if I never reach the end of that sort of tunnel, it's fun the whole way through. Yeah. And I've seen, I don't know if you've known people who retire, like who work a day job for 20, 30 years and then they retire. They totally lose that meaning. Or folks who sell a company and don't have anything else to do, it can wreak havoc on their motivation and their mental health. And you can go downhill, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's kind of a cliche at this point. Like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. But I think for me, it's like, I never, like, you don't, you don't realize you have until you lose it. You know, I'd never had a second of my life where I didn't have something like that. And without it, I'm like, what's going on? I feel so like, what's sort of hard to, hard to diagnose. I have 100% gone through exactly that. I don't, I don't even know how many times in my in my life from the time I was a teenager. And I've talked on this podcast about burning out essentially while growing drip and just how hard some of that piece was. I don't know if I had, I don't know what I had, if I had clinical depression for part of that, or if it was just burnout, because it was just hard. I was stressed all the time. It was a rough go. But what's interesting is more recently, like during COVID 2020, I think a lot of people had a tough year that year for a lot of reasons. So did I. And in fact, Sherry and I had just some, you know, we've been married 22 years now, like you're going to go through ups and downs. And we had a pretty tough stretch there in the middle of, of COVID. There were a few days where I kind of didn't get out of bed and I've never that messed up before emotionally. And I remember being like, I really want to keep doing like life and I really want to hang out with my family. But like, I don't have, I just didn't have the motivation to get up. I couldn't, I couldn't look at my Trello board and say, I want to do these things. I didn't want to do anything, you know, it's tough. And so I haven't traditionally been like, I don't have depression, right? I don't, I don't have, that's not a thing that plagues my life. In fact, I'm on the other side of the spectrum where I'm a stress anxiety person. That's my whole family tree is all like alcoholics, drug addicts who are self treating themselves for these anxieties, you know, and my dad, I've talked about this before, but he had, he has OCD. He had OCD so bad. He didn't leave his bedroom for seven months when I was a senior in high school and OCD is an anxiety disorder. So it definitely runs in my family and it's something I've learned to cope with as an adult. But I guess all that to say, like this topic of founder mental health in general is it's always resonated with me. And I think People never used to talk about it 10 years ago. And I think a lot more of us talk about it these days. And I think that's probably helpful to normalize it. So one of my favorite things about living on the West Coast is everybody on the West Coast compared to the East Coast in my experience is like, so like woo woo and like frou frou, like everyone on the West Coast that I know like has a therapist. <laughs> and on the East Coast, it's like a dirty word. Like you have a therapist? Like what's wrong with you? Like you know, I would never tell anybody about that. Right. But like uh, I have a therapist. He's awesome. He's like this like 75 year old Canadian dude. I want to go a million miles a minute. You know, I talk so fast. The second I get into therapy thing, I have like 15 things I want to talk about. He's like, let's slow down, Cortland. Let's take our time and find your center and be one with yourself. And I get like so frustrated for like the first five or 10 minutes. And then I slow down. I'm like, okay, this guy's like, I want to smoke what this guy's smoking because it feels good. And I know that I need it. I need to chill out a little bit. And so, yeah, I think it's worth taking the time, whether you're a founder or not. I think everybody should take the time to like check in with themselves and sort of work on your mental health. Because I think it's, if your mental health is in a good place, I don't think it's wise to take that for granted. And if your mental health is in like a tough place, <laughs> obviously it's like you got to prioritize that because that is sort of the engine that powers everything else in your life. And I think about it a lot when I think about like success and people struggling to do things like everybody's going through different shit. You know, I had so many, like, I had a ridiculously good leave it to beaver childhood. You know, like, I have zero trauma. <laughs> I have, like, zero, like, real, true, lasting hardships that I really had to push through that, like, left a scar on me. And so, like, I was, like, free in my 20s to just go tackle challenges without any mental health issues and stuff like that. But other people are, like, struggling to get out of bed. You know, they're struggling to deal with, like, terrible things that have happened to them. And they're trying to take on these big challenges. And I think that, like, it's really easy to underestimate that. And if you're going through that kind of stuff, if you are just sort of ignoring it, like, I think you're doing yourself a disservice. At times in my life, I have ignored it for too long. The other thing I ignored was physical issues. I know we're talking about mental health, but, like, I had really bad shoulder and back pain, neck pain, because we all hunch over our desks. And I had it for years, and it was kind of debilitating. It was to the point where I was under constant pain. And why the f 
didn't I do something about? I remember saying like, I don't have the time. And then I went to a chiropractor and a massage therapist and it like didn't fix it quick enough. And I was like, I just don't have time to carve out two hours a week to do this. So I, so I didn't do it. And it wasn't until we moved to Minneapolis, I'd sold the company. I went to three different massage folks and I found a dude who's really good. And he integrates all these different things. It's, it hurts like crazy, but he, I went to him twice a week for months and I just said, I'm carving out this time. It also helped that I wasn't, I didn't still run the company so I could just take a couple hours a week. And it took him months and months to work it out of me. And there were all these, you know, there's toxins and crap in your muscles when they're like that. And I remember being like almost, I would almost get sick after her because they were, I had just let it go for too long. And it's like these chronic mental or you shouldn't live like that. And I say that as much for anyone listening as I do for myself in the future. I refuse to live like that again, you know? Yeah, it's hard. Like I think I, I met a person and she was like telling me about this phase of her life where she was super grumpy. And she was just kind of an ass. And I asked her, I was like, why are you such an ass? Like, why were you being this way? And she's like, chronic pain. She was like, literally had chronic back pain and it would fire up. And you know, like what? doesn't make you a happy, agreeable person being in physical pain all the time. It makes you really short tempered. And I think lots of people have like different things like this that sort of affect us at a lower level and that like, you know, bubble up to how like we actually behave. And I think for founders in particular, we can be so single mindedly focused on what we're working on, right? So ambitious, so driven. I got to work on this business. It's got to take up every hour of every day. I've got to like nothing else is a higher priority. And like, it's easy to get into a mode where we're like, oh, let's put like working out on the back burner. <laughs> let's put mental health on the back burner. Let's put like physical, like all the stuff in the back. That can, you know, that can come later. And I think that that is like sort of a recipe for disaster. And it's really easy to like, I don't know, all these things. It's like, it's really basic advice, you know, get eight hours of sleep, take care of your body, blah, 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 blah. But like, it's not about whether you know that advice. It's about whether or not you're doing it. And I think 99% of people were not doing it. They're repeating it. You know, I'm repeating it, but not always doing it. Yeah. And it wasn't until I retired from Drip. Do you know Tiny Seas is my retirement project, right? That's what I, <laughs> that's what I told Anar yeah. when we, You've been put we out were to talking pasture. about it. I was like, yeah, I could, I could do this thing uh, just in, in my spare time. So I want to switch it up. We have so many topics on this thing, but Liam Simons says, if you had to fight one horse-sized duck or 100 duck-sized horses, which would you choose? Uh, 100 duck-sized horses. Me too. Easily. Yeah, that's. Can you imagine how terrifying a, a horse-sized duck would, <laughs> it would be? Say, I mean, that beak alone, like those things are hard. I don't know if a, if you've ever been pecked or like nibbled at by a duck or a goose. That <laughs> I stuff have. is scary, and their tongues are terrifying. <laughs> have you ever looked like a duck in the eyes? Like any bird, if you look like look yep. in their eyes, they're terrifying. They have these deeply inhuman eyes. I can't imagine like a horse-sized duck. I would I'd rather uh-uh. do almost anything. So easy, not with a ten-foot pole. Easy yep. answer for me. Me, t- me too, as well. I like that one to start, though. Let's talk about mental health and depression. Okay, let's talk about yeah. horse-sized ducks. <laughs> I had to switch it up, man. <laughs> it's just too, uh, and it's too close to home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, this is a good one. Greg Dignio says, at what point in Drip for Rob and in Indie Hackers for Cortland did you guys want to quit, and why didn't you? I wanted to quit. I wanted to quit when Russian spammers were hacking us. I wanted to quit when I thought I couldn't make payroll because I had overhired and I got a big tax, personal tax bill. I wanted to quit when competitors would rip off my stuff. When when we would spend months building and thinking and marketing thing, and someone would just rip it off shamelessly, and then cl- and the worst part was they would claim that it was their idea, and it was just so. I take business a little too personal, I'm going to be honest. And that really, that kind of stuff really bothered me. Heck, I wanted to, when, when I left Drip 2018, I, had a, I took a few months and I evaluated, do I want to walk away from startups altogether? Do I want to sell the podcast in Microconf? You know, there were times where I was like, I, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. And I mean, the reasons I didn't is because I, we talked about it earlier, is like I realized, oh, my mission in life is this thing, to promote entrepreneurship and to get more people finding freedom, purpose, and relationships through it. And when I realized that, it was like, well, I already have these platforms. Why don't I build on them and and just do more and double down? Yeah. I also think, and then in terms of drip, like the reasons I didn't quit when those were happening was momentum, to your point earlier, of momentum. Like I just had momentum going and I had a team I was working with and I couldn't just walk away. It's not like, like if I was indie founder, I may have like, I don't know, I may have trashed some stuff, you know, at a certain point, just table flipped and said, this is too hard. And I could do an idea that's more lucrative with for less work. But I had this team of, you know, three, then five, then 10. And it's like, well, we're all, everybody's on board. And they kept me accountable unintentionally. They didn't come and say, you need to be accountable. But I felt the burden of like, no, I got, we, I had the vision. We all got on board with this thing. And I can't walk away from this. Yeah. I see this a lot with like founders where like, I think it's kind of a miracle 
like if you look out into the world, there's billions and billions of people who wake up every day at 9 a.m. and go to a job. They don't even like that much <laughs> and work that job and come up and they're consistent and they'll do that day after day for years. Right. I, mean, I talked to a lot of founders and it's really hard for founders to like our podcasters or whatever it is to last for more than like a few months where they're like, ah, I give up. You know, it's too much work. And I think one of the biggest difference makers there is besides the obvious, like I got to get the bills paid, is that accountability. Right. It's the fact that like, I actually have teammates and a boss and people who are depending on me. And I think we're just tribal creatures. Like we're sort of wired to like not want to let down the people around us. You know, if we commit to something and we agree to something and we have work that's waiting for us, like it feels shitty to just quit and like not do that. And so I think one of the best things you can do as a founder, if you really want to stick with what you're doing, which is sort of necessary for succeeding, is to surround yourself with people who you feel accountable to. Even if like you're their boss, you still kind of feel accountable to your employees, to your partners, your co-founders, your team. And like, I love feeling that way. Like I like my Ari, my podcast producer, <laughs> I don't want to let her down. Like part of her work is dependent on me getting the podcast out. And she keeps me like, we have a calendar event twice a week. I got to meet with Ari. Like sometimes I cancel, but like, I'll feel bad if I just abandon it, you know? And so for me, I, I've, I've also sort of ridden off momentum. You know, I never really wanted to quit any actors at all when things were going up and to the right. And then in the early days, I had this email list where I would send out my progress every single week. Here's what I did. Here's what I did. And people would respond. And so I feel super bad if I just didn't do anything for weeks. It'd be embarrassing, quite frankly. Like, what am I going to tell these people? I did nothing. And so I had a lot of late nights on Wednesdays where I would just try to do something to report because I was accountable. And the only time I ever got to feeling like, you know, maybe this is what I shouldn't do was last year when I started feeling a little depressed, a little bit down. Some of the things I was trying to do to grow the site like weren't working out. And so that sort of feedback loop I've talked about before of, of you know, positive things happening and encouraging you to try more things in the future and you know, being optimistic was sort of slowing down. And I was like, well, I'm trying these things and that site's not growing like I want. And so like, maybe that this is it, you know, maybe I'm out of ideas and, you know, maybe I should rest on my laurels. I've done a good thing. And, you know, I wasn't working as much. Rosie Sherry, our community manager quit. And so our team was like sort of winding down a little bit and we didn't replace her. And so I had fewer of those mechanisms in place that keep you motivated. And uh, it's the closest I've ever gotten to wanting to quit and exploring like different things. Wow. So John Howard asks, I always love the conversations of the scrappy early days for indie hackers and bootstrappers and then throws out a bunch of questions. What does it take to get to an MVP? What does it take to get to dollar one? What does it take to define your audience? I've been through it a bunch, but a framework is always fun. My favorite framework, if I was an indie hacker right now, starting from nothing, is to just literally just solve someone's problem, like any problem. Put as little bull as possible between you solving somebody's problem and getting paid for that as you can. And so Nathan Barry has this excellent blog post called like the ladders of uh, wealth creation. I recommend it. And it's kind of like the way he puts it is like there's a sort of reliable progression that you can take to like earn, build more wealth. And at the bottom ladder, you've got like trading your time for money, like working for an employer, having a job. And the top of the ladder is like, you're selling products, right? You've got like a social network or a marketplace or a subscription software business or something. And you try to work your way there gradually. And I think what I would do is I would just start at the bottom. Okay, I'm selling time for money. Well, how do I do that? But instead of working for somebody else, working for myself, right? And so like you can go to, for example, ND Hackers is a website where people have tons of problems. You can go to ND Hackers, click monthly, see the top posts for every month. And like a top post for January is share your project and I'll try to find you users. And there's 330 comments <laughs> of people who are like, I'm working on this project and I have a problem. I can't find any users. And there's this kind of this one guy is going through replying to everyone and just trying to figure out what their problem is and try to help them solve it. And like, I bet you 10, 20 percent of the people he talks to, he could get on a phone call and be like, hey, you know, 200 bucks. I'll do a consulting call with you. We'll see where it goes. And he can make thousands of dollars tomorrow with like five or six consulting calls just because he's solving somebody's problem. He doesn't have to build a fancy website. He doesn't have to hire a team and build an app. He doesn't have to do anything. He's just literally like, what's your problem? I will try as hard as I can to solve it for people who are motivated to solve these problems because they think they'll make money. And so if I were starting out, I would do that and just follow that path and see where it takes me. Because when you solve somebody's problem, they pay you for it. Like that's a, a pretty good indicator that you're onto the right thing. And you can maybe tweak your idea to try to change your customer or the problem that you solve. But it doesn't require you being particularly brilliant. It just requires you going to a source of problems, which are really easy to find on the internet, and then rolling up your sleeves and doing something today, like right now. Yeah, I'm glad you bring up the solve a problem because I always forget to mention it because it is so ingrained. And it is such like a fundamental precept that I don't even bring that up because I expect everyone already knows that, but they don't. And so I'm glad, right. I'm glad that you did. It's the curse of knowledge. Yep, it totally is. I forget. Well, of course, 
you should solve a problem, but it's like, well, not of course for some people listening to this podcast it's of course, because I've been talking about this stuff for 17 years. And I think it's fascinating. We have the MicroConf state of independent SaaS survey. We do a survey and then put out a report and we talk about how people found their startup idea, their SaaS idea specifically. And I just pulled the report up and 45% of respondents said they came up with their idea for their product or company. 45%. It was a specific problem that they were experiencing. And then it's another 22%, a problem my customers or clients were experiencing. So you're at two thirds now. Another 13% was a problem or experience at my day job. So now we're at 80%. Another 11%, a problem a friend or relative was experiencing. We're at 91% of all, hundreds and hundreds of respondents. So the rest is, I mean, we're at 91, yeah, we're at 91%. The last three are 8% said research, 1.5% said other, and 0.2% said I purchased the business. And so it's just like a problem that me or someone around me is experiencing. But it's a problem. It is. And I think it's super important because if you're not solving a problem, this is where like I get a little prescriptive with the B2B versus B2C thing. You and I have talked about this in the past. Like I just am so bullish on B2B and really bearish on B2C. Not only because I've owned, I think, two or three products or companies, one was an e com site that served consumers, but because every B2C company, specifically a subscription company that I see, bootstrappers, they just, the churn is too high. They can't find customers' lifetime value. So, you know, it's just the same problems over and over. So I don't, I never say never do this, but I say you probably don't want to do this because the problems you solve for consumers are just not as, there's not as much value as if you solve it for businesses. It's super true. You know, at the end of the day, like businesses have way more money than consumers. They are more motivated to fix it most of the time. They have a gigantic list of problems. They need to hire. They need to find office space. They need to market. They need to do sales. They need to solve their own customers' problems. They need an email solution. They need hosting. They need accounting. Businesses have so many problems that they need solved. It's just generally a better bet to go that way. That being said, I do think if you're judicious about it and you want to do something that targets consumers, you can. You just have to really think about the problem. Again, you can't think about like, oh, I want to build this solution. I want to build this app or this service. You got to think about what's the problem I'm solving and like, what is the nature of this problem? Specifically, is this a problem that is lucrative to solve? Because if it's not, you might solve it. You might get happy customers who say thank you, and you're not making any money because they're churning or they're only they're expecting it for free. And so, like, if you look at where consumers spend money or even where businesses spend money, I think the same formula applies. If you want to find a problem that's lucrative, just look what people are paying to do. Right. Every time somebody spends money, it's because they're trying to solve a problem. People spend a ton of money on housing. People spend a ton of money on transportation. People spend so much money on education. It's crazy. I think that's what people are like the most business like, where they think, okay, if I get this education, if I go to the school or I take this course, I will then be able to use those skills I develop to go make more money in the future. <laughs> and so people are like willing to go into like hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt <laughs> to get education because they see how it will make them money in the future. And so I think it's not a coincidence that like most of the people I know who have consumer businesses that are successful are educating consumers in some way and helping those consumers become better versions of themselves. Whereas people who are trying to sell like these little tools and apps and productivity software <laughs> find it much harder because like the problems they're solving for consumers is like not that valuable. Like the average consumer like doesn't need a to-do list to organize their life. You know, whereas a business might need that because they have a bunch of, you know, employees to coordinate, et cetera, and it's valuable for them. Yeah. So I like that. And then there's a bunch of different ways to do that, right? Like I'm working on this book and I have like seven different, not frameworks, just thoughts of like finding a problem, looking around you, translate an existing idea to a new niche where it's like, oh, CRM software. Well, you know who doesn't have CRM software is home improvement contractors. And you know who built a home improvement contractor CRM is Jonathan with Builder Prime. And he built it to good revenue and then applied to tiny seed and he was in batch two. It's like just taking a simple idea of like, we're all familiar with CRM, but there are all these spaces that don't have it. And an, another one is like looking at a large space, a competitive space. This is if you're probably if you're further along on the stair step approach, but that has a hated competitor. And so for Drip, it was Infusionsoft, right? And, and Marketo and Pardot. I think for Zero, you know, the accounting software, it was QuickBooks. They were the not QuickBooks for Derek Reimer and Savvy Cal. Very competitive space. And I wouldn't say Calendly is a hated competitor, but there's definitely were some improvements and, and some stagnation in that space. So the problem is, is it's the, the paradox of choice where there's infinite. It's like, well, I could look anywhere for a problem. And it's like, well, maybe focus on something you have or at a day job or friend around. Like look at each of these things in turn and keep a notebook around for a month 
and then look at what are your expertises in. If you've been a software developer at credit card companies for 10 years, you probably know more about credit card companies and finance and banking than others. So maybe you should lean into that a bit, you know, or if you, you worked at Shopify for five or 10 years. So it's like, you probably know e-commerce well better than most people. There's, there's opportunity there. I love constraints for that. Like the, what you're listing are basically constraints. Exactly. And they're not just any constraints, they're like clever constraints that raise your chances of succeeding. And I think that the challenge with most people looking for ideas is like you get into the scarcity mindset where you're like, oh, there's just so few ideas out there. It's so hard. I can't constrain myself and limit where I focus on ideas. I need to look at everything. Otherwise, I'm never going to find one. Or which is, I think the counterintuitive answer to that is actually <laughs> you're way more likely to find a good idea if you have a bunch of constraints and rules that limit where you search because then you'll dig much deeper. You know, and so like your, your constraints could be anything. It can be like what you're saying, like, hey, what do I have ex- skills or experience and what have I done at my job? What problem have I experienced myself? Your constraints can also be totally arbitrary. You can have a constraint of like, I like to be outside. <laughs> what can I do that lets me be outside? You can have a constraint that says, you know, I like to have an impact on the world. What would allow me to have the Im- an impact on the world? You can have a constraint that says, I like to work with my family. You know, what's something I can do with my family members or I like food. And any of these constraints will just narrow your focus and help you, I think, dig deeper on an idea without having to have this paralysis of choice where you're sort of juggling like a million different balls. And the cool thing is if they are constraints that make you happy, if they are constraints that build relationships with people, they are constraints that allow you to do things you're going to enjoy doing, then not only do they help you sort of come up with an idea, but they help you enjoy working on that idea <laughs> after you come up with it. And so for me, like I have like a gigantic list of just random constraints and things to ask myself if I ever start a new business that I'm going to kind of go through. I could do these all day. There's so many, we got like... A thousand questions. I know. I am going to come back to these in at a minimum in future episodes where I am answering questions or just in, just as topics. I think you and I separately could cover these and it would be interesting. And then if we're back together at some you know at some point here in the next three to five months, we should. I like this as a podcast format. Like I think you do this on Startups for the Rest of Us sometimes, where it's just like Q and A. You know, ask us questions. Mm-hmm. I never do it on Indie Hackers, but I should do it more often. I should like I could do Q and A and always bring on a guest and just do joint Q and As like this. And I think it would be always entertaining, like once every couple months. Yep. So I have gotten a lot of positive feedback about the listener question episodes. And I sometimes do them solo because I've, I mean, I've just done a bunch of them. That's hard to do when you're first starting out, but I've been able to do it. And then about half of the ones I do are with guests and I rotate through the guests. It helps if people know who the guests are, because if it's a random, not a random, but just a relatively unknown person that most of the audience doesn't know, you have to give a lot of background about why they have the credibility to answer these questions and why people should listen to their answers. But if they're someone that most people know, or maybe you interviewed them, I mean, what I used to do is I would interview them one week, do a listener question the next week with them to be like, refer back to that episode, right? Because you just heard their story. Then I would handpick the questions. This is way inside baseball, but I would handpick, because I, let's say I have 20 20 questions available for startups the rest of us, I would think of what is this founder's experience? Like they've bootstrapped to half a million and then they sold. So I'm going to do anything about early stage bootstrapping, nothing about raising funding, nothing about being a multi-million dollar company. I would like hand pick the questions to make sure that they would have input on it. Mm, that's super smart. To so curate, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a challenge to think podcasts and media in general when you're doing stuff with guests. It's like, who in my audience even knows who this person is, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And it's like, even within an episode, it's like, okay, I know this person I'm talking to has a lot of good advice, but also people don't even might not even care about their advice if they don't know their story or what they've accomplished, et cetera. And so it's like I'll try to structure episodes just like that stuff comes first. And doing Q&A episodes is the same. It's sort of like, okay, well, maybe I do it the way that you do it. Have a story first, an episode like that, and then do Q&A. But then I, my worry is, okay, what if people didn't listen to that episode? <laughs> and like, who is this person? So what I would do is I would say they were on last episode. If for some reason you didn't have it, here's 60 seconds. And I would build, I would basically have bullets of like, they started this, they got it to this size, they sold it. Like I would try to build their credibility really quickly. Here's why you should care. Here's why you should care because this person knows a lot about XYZ, you know? Yep, yep. All right. Is this one, Peter Levels asked, how was the bootstrap scene in 2010 or earlier and how did it change with indie makers, et cetera? Were you around bootstrappers that long ago? Yeah, okay. I was reading a bunch of Basecamp stuff back okay. then. I was reading a bunch of like um, Patio 11 stuff. I was reading Peldi and Balsamic back then. What about me, bro? What am I, chocolate? <laughs> I was writing all kinds <laughs> of stuff. You know, you're like, oh, this guy's so I read, I read, I read I hate none this of it. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just skipped. I just clicked Mark Red. Nope. Uh, spam. <laughs> His emails go to spam. But the, you've named everybody. 
that was it. I mean, in 2010, it was, I say everybody, I'm being a little facetious, but it's like there was Joel Spolsky. So the, the only two people I knew talking about entrepreneurship in any way that resonated with me that wasn't just bullshit Silicon Valley, everybody raise, raise, raise.com was Joel Spolsky, who started vlogging in 2000, 2001, and Paul Graham, who, while well, you could say, well, he started Y Combinator, Venture Cup, but I was like, no, no, no. But he actually built a startup. He actually sold it to Yahoo in the 90s. And then he think so pragmatically compared to a bunch of the VC crap I was reading and Inc. Magazine and Red Herring and all that stuff. So that was just the two of them in the early 2000s. Then Basecamp came around. It was 2005, 2006. It was called 37 Signals. First, it was a blog. They were a consulting firm. Then they launched a SaaS. And then it was me, Peldy, Patio 11. And those were the only people that I knew until, I don't know, 2008, nine. That was kind of it. It was super niche. It was super niche. There was wasn't. I mean, I did Y Combinator in um, January 2011, and I remember going into it and talking to Paul Graham. I was like, I really like the Basecamp guys. I like what they're you know, what they're saying. I remember Kevin Hale from Wufu came in and gave a talk, and he's like, Yeah, we never raise any money. We're making like five million in re- revenue. We moved to Florida. It's pretty cool. And Paul Graham was like, he was super pragmatic. He's like, Don't raise more money than you need to. It kills a lot of companies that could have had you know a 20, 30, 40 million dollar exit. They swing for the fences, try to become unicorns. And like they weren't destined, their company can't do that. So don't raise that money and go for the gold if you can't. And so he was even pragmatic about it. But like there wasn't a lot out there that was inspirational. And nowadays it's like a deluge. Like you could read and read and read all day, listen to 15 different podcasts and then discover another 200 podcasts and never get to the bottom of it. It's just the secret's out, right? Like you can make money online in a self-funded, self-sustainable way from the comfort of your own home. And I think that's the biggest difference. And bootstrapping wasn't, I mean, it was kind of a thing, but it's not, it like now you say bootstrapping and people know like that's a movement. Like there are tens of thousands of us that want to do that. And it just wasn't. There were a handful of people, there was no community, there was no central hub. And in fact, that's why like when we started this podcast and I wrote my book, it was still, it was like startups for the rest of us. Like if you look back, like this podcast should probably be called bootstrapping, blah, blah, blah. But we didn't, while the term existed, it just didn't have the resonance with this idea. It was more like, well, I want to do startups because they sound fun, but I'm going to do it in a different way was really, really the angle there. So do you think bootstrapping is still going to like, in my opinion, I think it's a less relevant term than it ha- was in the past. I wonder what your thoughts are like in the future of bootstrapping and like yeah. how it is today. I feel the same way. I think you put out a post about this a year ago where you're just like, is this really important? Is the funding mechanism the most important part of this business or is the problem that you solve, how you go about solving it, how you grow it? Like, isn't that all really important? I've, I've struggled with that whole thing of like technically like a scraping bee Post, they're they're a tiny seed company, but they're very public about their revenue. They're doing nor, you know north of a million dollars, and they got to the top of Hacker News with a post that's like how we bootstrap to north of a million. And the biggest conversation in there was just arguing over the term bootstrapping and whether they really bootstrap because they took tiny seed money. And it's like if you talk to venture capitalists, if you raise less than a million dollars, most will be like, well, they basically bootstrap then. That to them, it's bootstrapping. But to someone who, you know, I've built businesses with literally zero dollars, that is technically bootstrapping. But is it at all important to define well, what if what if my dad gave me 10 grand? Am I still bootstrapping? Yeah. Compared to so that's where I've like stopped. It's not binary. I never thought it was binary. It's it's a continuum, right? There are people who raise a little, raise a lot, raise half a million and are still acting like bootstrappers. They're super capital efficient. They're super pragmatic and they're building a real product for real customers who pay them real money. And that's what we all do, whether you have zero dollars in the bank or half a million. We've I, I say bootstrap and mostly bootstrapped now, you'll hear me. You'll hear us say independent SaaS or indie SaaS because it implies, well, I'm not beholden to anyone. Even if I raise money, I still have control of my company. We've toyed, I've toyed around with all these terms. The thing I struggled with is in the state of Indie SaaS this year, the report's not out yet. We did the survey. We said, what do you call like your type of company? And we had all these options and it was like bootstrap SaaS, Indie SaaS, independent SaaS, blah, blah, blah. And it was like overwhelmingly bootstrap SaaS. Even people who had raised 100 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand. Yeah, I think in a way, like the focus on bootstrapping, even as a thing, it was sort of a reaction, right? It's a reaction to the fact that like yes. big tech really only cared about people who were fundraising. And if you wanted to get any sort of media attention, if you wanted to have any sort of success, if you wanted to have any sort of like support or resources, like you kind of had to go that path, which is not surprising because it was like in the early nascent days of startups. Not that many people were doing startups. And so the people who had all the money, the VCs sort of controlled the narratives. And so if you wanted to do something outside of that path, like you had to be very vocal about the fact that this is different. I am bootstrapping, et cetera. There's another way. And I think it's kind of like a measure of success 
that's not as important anymore. Right. The fact that like it's no longer a shocking thing <laughs> that you didn't raise a whole ton of money to start your company and it still was successful means that like bootstrapping kind of like won its place as like a valid sort of a way to, to sort of get started, which means it's not worth like glor <laughs> glorifying quite as much as it used to. You know, it's kind of okay, there's a lot of different paths. Everyone's well aware of that. And pick your pick your poison. Pick your preferred choice. So I don't know. I don't feel like, you know, when Andy Hacker started, I felt like there was like a big sort of fight I was always trying to wage. Like, you don't have to do it this other way. And the, the VCs, the investors, like, you, you don't have to do that. And now I'm like, nah, it's kind of obvious you don't have to do that. <laughs> I don't need to toot that horn. Now it's more about, okay, what do you want to do and how do you do it? There's all these paths. And, and funding is a tool. And if you want and need that tool, then do it. And if you don't, then don't. And that's you could be on Indie Hackers or part of MicroConf and you can raise money or not. It's just we're all in this trying to become independent, sustainable companies. I find it interesting because you brought up that bootstrapping and, and the real, I think, religious adherence to it was a reaction against the broader narrative of venture funding. I had this exact conversation about two weeks ago with a friend of mine. I know that, and I think Basecamp was a big part of that, to be honest. Joel Swolsky was a little bit, but Basecamp was so vocal about it and they got a lot of press about it. And I was talking to my friend and I said, I understand why they did it. And, you know, I like Jason and, and DHH. They invested in Tiny Seeds First Fund, their mentor. Like, I get it. But I actually think they went a little, I think they may have long term done some damage, I think, by making it such a religious thing. Like, they, you know, they, they used to say, like, well, bootstrap will never take funding. Anyone who takes funding is XYZ. They also would say, like, we don't split test. We don't track in our funnel. Like, we would never sell our company. Like, planning is guessing. We don't market. It just works. And they said all these things and they were shocking. And, but I think a lot of people saw that or still hear it and think that that's the way to grow a business. And I actually think it's not. I think those are anti patterns. And I asked Jason Fried about, he's been to MicroConf. He and I have had breakfast. He was on stage. I did a QA with him. I asked him about some of these things, you know, about like why was Basecamp successful? He said, we got a lot of things right, but we got a little lucky. He admits that, you know, they were early, they built a good product, and, and they did hit something just right at the right time. But I do think that that narrative is a bit, uh, the religious nature of it, or this utter black and white nature of it, I think is a bit played out. And I think it's an anti pattern. I think it's detrimental to new entrepreneurs coming into the scene. Yes. There's like a, a sense in which it's like, you kind of got to look at like, why are people writing and saying the things that they're doing? And the Basecamp guys are just expert marketers. Like they are really, really good. I mean, they built productivity software and they were like trailblazers. I mean, they created Rails, you know, they were doing this like way before everybody else. But also like they really got people excited about the fact that they built productivity software. And how do they do that? By having great marketing, great messaging. They always stood for something. They always had an enemy and, you know, and like the, the sort of point there wasn't necessarily like, let's be responsible stewards of how everyone starts companies in the future. It was like, how do we get the word out about our philosophy and our ideals? You don't do it by making lukewarm statements. You do it by saying like fundraising is evil. <laughs> you know, you do it by saying like we're, we're fighting against the big guys. And like that's the kind of messaging that resonates, that gets people talking. People argue against you. People take a side. Even in, even on their, like I think it was Rework or it, was, it doesn't have to be crazy at work. One of their books, they have like a chapter that's basically like, pick a fight, <laughs> you know, and they're just telling you their strategies, like pick a fight. And I, I think that does create, if you are not the sort of person to think about things deeply, it does create like religious zealots who take a side and who don't like give the other side any real thought. And I don't think that's the best way to be as a founder. I think the best way to be as a founder is when you're marketing, pick a side, be super, you know, like out there and, and opinionated, opinionated. Exactly. But when you're making decisions internally, be rational, do cost benefit analyses, <laughs> figure out what it is that you want. Don't close yourself off to any particular path for religious reasons. I think that's good advice, not only for founders, but for all humans actually yeah. to just, you know, to evaluate both sides of that. I'm glad you said you're like, they're expert marketers and they did this as marketing. The best marketing is when you don't know you're being marketed to, right? This is what Steve Jobs and Apple did so well is he would do these things that everyone would like want to be like, we're not going to live stream our product announcements. It's like no other company does that. They want as many people to see it, but they're like, no, no thanks. Like we, it's this secret thing, you know, and, and, and Basecamp did well with that, so. I had DHH on Andy Hackers a couple years ago and we did like a debate. So I'm like, all right, DHH is like this firebrand on Twitter. Let's do a debate on like work-life balance. And I was trying to set him up with somebody that would be like his hated enemy, like Keith or or something. And he refused. He's like, no, I'm not going to come on and take to talk to somebody that I hate. So I had him talk to uh, Natalie Nagelli, who runs a very calm company, um, Wild Bit. It's very bootstrapped. It's very like kind of in his style. But she had kind of a different point of view and thought that DHH's point of view was unrealistic. And it was so interesting, the difference between him on Twitter starting these crazy fights, taking these like crazy hardline opinionated positions. And him, when you talk to him, and it's like a real-time conversation, and he's utterly reasonable and rational 
and it's like okay you can see you can see the difference you know and the marketing is like marketing well sir we've been we've been chatting for a while there's a lot of good yeah good good topics here i hope that folks in both of our feeds have uh, enjoyed this conversation i'm at rob walling on twitter you are cs allen that's a l l e n and of course indiehackers.com and I don't know. What do I say? Microconf.com? I something. <laughs> Come, we, we do a lot of things, but thanks for hanging out, man. Yeah. Well, I think if you're an indie hacker listening to this and you know, you're considering starting a company and you, you want to like do something a little bit bigger, uh, raise money from Tiny Seed. I love Tiny Seed. I think raising money is totally cool. And at the end of the day, like Tiny Seed is sort of designed for people who have the bootstrapper mindset. You know, trying to find investors is, I think, a, a big part of that is finding the right match. And so I like what you're doing at Tiny Seed. I like anyone who's basically trying to help indie hackers. And so I'm, I'm putting in here an involuntary ad for your Appreciate <laughs> your, it, man. For your, your funding mechanism here. Check out Tiny Seed if you're an indie hacker. Thanks. And yeah, this will go live when applications are still open for our we do two funding batches a year in, in the US and the Americas, and then we do one in Europe. And so if you hear this and you get there quick enough, head to tinyseed.com slash apply and uh, apply to our accelerator. It's super fun. It's a year long remote and it is focused on bootstrap and mostly bootstrap SaaS. Cool. All right, man. Thanks for coming out. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's always great to talk to Cortland, and it's been too long. He and I both agreed that we should we should do this more often because we could have gone another hour, and I think it would still be interesting. So hope you enjoyed that. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, and I will be back again in your ears next Tuesday morning. Mm-hmm.